good afternoon, everyone. Thank you ever so much for joining us. As Heather mentioned, Liz and I are partners and solicitors at Hempson's and members of our COVID inquiry team. The aim of today's webinar is to touch base following publication of the draft terms of reference. So I will give a quick recap of where we are in the inquiry process and then spend a short um, time reviewing um, the terms of reference and what we can glean from them at this stage. I will then hand over to Liz, who will discuss the consultation on the draft terms and how to prepare for the inquiry at this stage. We will then hear from Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. So without further ado, how did we get to where we are? May last year, nearly a year ago, the PM announces to the Commons an independent statutory inquiry into the pandemic to start in spring 2022, about a year later. Then about seven months later, towards the end of last year, the chair of the inquiry was announced, the Right Honourable Baroness Heather Hallett. And for those of you who have not yet found the inquiry website, you'll see a short video on there of the chair introducing herself. And then about three months later, just under two weeks ago, the draft terms of reference were given to the chair by the government. Um, note that this inquiry is UK wide but it said it will not duplicate any inquiry on a devolved basis. Um, notably, Scotland, I think, is the only um, devolved administration where they've announced their own inquiry. So the draft terms of reference, these set the scope of the inquiry and were created following consultation with the chair and the ministers in the devolved administration. Um, before delving into the draft terms, um, if you go on the Gov UK website, we're told that the terms and therefore the inquiry are intended to cover preparedness, the public health response, the response of the health and social care sectors and the economic response. So that's the intention of the terms and therefore the inquiry. But what are in fact the draft terms of reference? Um, for those of you who have not got around to reading them yet, they're contained in two pages of fairly dense text. You can find them very easily if you Google um, draft terms of reference COVID inquiry. There are two subheadings, essentially two chapters, um, one looking backwards and one looking forwards. Um, so the first is to examine the response and the impact of the pandemic and to produce a factual narrative account. So a sort of retrospective fact finding stage. And then the second aim is to learn lessons, look forward from that huge document, no doubt that will be produced um, as to the inquiry from stage one and to see what can be learned for the future, for future preparations. So there are three sort of jumping back into the first stage, um, and that's really where your response and the preparation of your response comes in now, um, and also your thoughts about what the terms of reference are. Um, the first stage it being a retrospective fact finding look at what happened, um, the response and impact of the pandemic and, and production of a factual narrative account. There are three subheadings to that first stage, the fact finding stage, the central devolved and local public health decision making and consequences such as shielding prisons. Number two, which is our focus, health and care sectors. And the three, the economic response, which will be things like support for businesses and jobs, the furlough scheme, I should imagine, etc. So again, drilling down. So we've got the first stage, which is fact finding retrospective looking at what went on. There are seven key lines of inquiry. Um, the key to note is that really no stone is left unturned. Um, also that when you read the terms of reference above these seven key lines of inquiry, um, it says to include these seven points. So it's not exclusively, there could be more things added. And that obviously is no doubt part of the um, consultation process. So number one, um, preparedness, initial capacity is also a number one, and the ability to increase capacity and resilience. Um, nightingales aren't specifically identified within the key lines of inquiry, but we assume they'll probably fall within this first one. Um, perhaps also the use of the independent sector, um, perhaps the use of surgical hubs and hot and cold sites, all that sort of within the preparedness and capacity section, perhaps. Number two, here we have hospitals. Um, the management of the pandemic in hospitals, so sort of secondary care teased out as to one key line of inquiry. Um, within that, if you read the terms of reference in detail, it says including infection prevention and control, triage, critical care capacity, the discharge of patients, the use of DNA CPR decisions, the approach to palliative care, 
workforce testing, changes to inspection and the impact on staff and staffing levels. So that's quite a long list. Um, the mention of triage in there is not clear. It's just a word triage. Um, we assumed it's aimed at how and where patients were triaged, the impact of infection control, perhaps. Um, within there is possibly also hospital inquired infections. Um, perhaps consideration should also be given to anything relating to the adequacy of triage for differentiating between COVID and other conditions, especially in those early days when we were all learning what actually COVID symptoms were and how to test for them. Um, there is a mention of changes to inspection, as I said, and that's really obviously aimed at uh, regulators. Um, interesting, again, in this number two, the hospital section, when they talk staff, they say the impact of staff on staff is distinguished from staffing levels. So you've got the impact on staff and staffing levels um, separately. So we anticipate there will be a focus on staff well-being, support and initiatives that were set up to support staff. Also, of course, emotional and physical consequences of working within the healthcare sector in the pandemic, long term absences, staff fatality. So that's all. It's pretty um, it's pretty lengthy, as you can imagine, and very broad reaching. Um, then some of the information, of course, within there before you start to slightly panic will be statistical and can be provided by NHS England that we imagine, such as inpatient numbers, capacity, bed occupancy, staffing and trust will, of course, have ready access to this as you were reporting it regularly on, on um, into NHS England. Um, then number three, so separately we've got the sort of preparedness capacity point, then we've got hospitals and now three care settings. Um, the management of the pandemic in care homes and other care settings, including infection prevention and control, the transfer of residents to or from homes, treatment and care of residents, restriction on visiting and changes to inspections. Um, so this will perhaps also in encompass decisions made early on to discharge patients into care homes and the consequences perhaps. Um, number four, procurement and distribution of Equip key equipment and supplies, including PPE and ventilators, um, possibly to include dis distribution and use of PPE within hospitals. I know at some stages there's been talk about, um, uh, I mean, I think we've all seen the saw the images of people making their own bin bag um, sort of equipment. And so perhaps that will be included in that section rather than the hospital section, or maybe there'll be overlap as to how they actually write it at the end. Um, then there's also the, the delivery and development of therapeutics and vaccines. Perhaps there'll be some GP primary care and CCG input into that level, um, because as you'll see, there's not actually a specifically primary care focus um, in those seven key lines of inquiry. Um, and then number six, the consequences on the provision on the, of the pandemic on the provision for non-COVID related conditions and needs which will no doubt include the impact and cancellation of elective lists, the impact and delayed diagnosis and treatment of, for example, cancer, which um, we as litigators are already seeing some claims like that filtering through, the impact on waiting lists, increased use of telemedicine, perhaps the increase in mental health need, especially for children and young people, so that we sort of anticipate those sort of things will be coming up in there. And then number seven, the provision for those with long COVID. So it's pretty lengthy, as you can see, very broad reaching. Um, and requires a sort of read and a think. Um, so there are, where we are, seven. Um, so there is going to be an enormous amount of information collated by the chair in her in her team in stage one, which they then want to focus on in stage two. So that's learning lessons from the evidence they've gathered in stage one. And that's basically a one liner in the terms of reference. So you've got a huge amount of key lines acquired in stage one and then learning lessons that's it in stage two. Um, so to meet the aims, the draft terms of reference say the inquiry will listen to bereaved families and others, but will not investigate individual cases of harm or death um, in detail. Note in detail. Listening to these accounts, however, will inform its understanding of the impact of the pandemic and the response and of the lessons to be learned. So there will be, um, and they do say it in the, in the um, in the inquiry website that they intend to go around the country and, and, and take evidence. Um, highlight where lessons identified from preparedness and the response to the pandemic may be applicable to other civil emergencies. Um, so that's sort of going broader even still. Consider the experiences and impact on healthcare and sector workers and other key workers during the pandemic. Um, also, consider any disparities evident in the impact of the pandemic and the state's response 
including those related to protected characteristics. So that's sort of very much teased out. And then also have a reasonable regard to relevant international comparisons. And crucially, as you know, some of these reports can go on for um, inquiries can go on for years and years and years. It's clear that Baroness Hallett does not want this to be one of those cases. So she's um, specifically noted that she wants to produce the report and any interim reports and recommendations in a timely manner. And again, if you go back to the, the COVID website and see her um, introduction, she makes that perfectly clear when she's introducing herself um, to the public. So that was an absolute whistle stop to I appreciate that it's difficult to take a huge amount from that, but the point is it's very broad. Um, and I will now pass over with no further ado to Liz. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I'm just going to take control of the uh, slides. Um, lovely to see so many of you um, back for, for this update sem seminar. Um, and for those of you who know me and those who've been in um, previous seminars, um, You'll be surprised to hear that I'm not going to talk uh, for too long uh, today uh, and partly I'm not going to talk uh, for too long because we have a couple of colleagues with us from um, from one of the trusts that we're working with um, up here in the the north of England um, and I want to give them time to share their their early um, lessons and insights uh, with you and also give time for some some questions at the end. Um, but do remember that, that there's a number of practicalities and issues that I'm going to touch upon um, as we just move on in the next part of this session and um, that have been covered to a degree in earlier sessions. So please do access um, via Hempson's website our earlier webinars in this series. There's a total of seven of them. Um, and whilst I appreciate they predate uh, the terms of reference, um, they, they are still very valid um, and you'll find a lot of in, insight in there. Um, what I want to take a look at first is the consultation process. Um, so Elizabeth uh, ex explained to you that we've had these draft terms of reference published um, and um, the, the, those terms of reference have now gone out to a period of consultation um, and it's open to, um, to, to people to, to provide an online uh, response. So the question is, well, should we? Um, why? Um, is there anything to, to be achieved? Uh, by by doing so. Um, and the question very succinctly in terms of why can be answered by uh, what the inquiry team themselves have said to, to ensure that everybody can have their say on how the inquiry should go um, about its work. Um, and it's really with an aim of shaping those fine, final terms of reference. Um, and importantly also though, to, to influence the order in which evidence may be heard and how the inquiry may interact and engage uh, with uh, with the public. Um, Elizabeth mentioned that uh, Baroness Hallett has already said that she will take the uh, inquiry um, on the road. Um, and if any of you are familiar with the ongoing infected blood inquiry, that's a, an approach that's been taken um, within that. They, they've had the centralised hearings taking place in London, um, but they've also undertaken regional hearings um, in various locations around the UK. And of course, it's open to any of you um, to provide a response, to do so as individuals um, or to do so on behalf of the organisation um, for whom you, you work. Um, but of course, bearing in mind that if you're speaking on behalf of the, the, the organisation, then you should have that authority to do so. And it's actually really easy to partake in, in the consultation process and it won't take you particularly long um, to do so because as we're going to look at, the questions are, are rather narrow. Um, but there is an online survey. Um, if you follow the uh, link um, to the public inquiry website um, linked at the top of this slide um, and I think it was in the information that we sent out prior to, to today. Um, there's an online um, survey which is open until uh, 2359 on the 7th of April 2022 so put a note in your diary if you're keen to provide some input into, into that consultation. Um, and of course, as I said, it, it, it does ask you whether um, a, a, as a proprietary question, whether you're providing um, what wishing to provide your personal uh, information and background. You don't need to do so. Um, you can you can anonymously respond to the consultation. And in fact, when I was given it a test run, I think I may have submitted a, a, a blank response with no details and no answers to any of the questions. Um, but in terms of what are those what are the questions that, that, that the consultation asks you? Well, the first substantive question um, is whether um, the inquiry's uh, draft terms of reference cover all the things that you think it should be covered. And if no, what other things should be covered? Um, 
any of you who've got experience of public inquiries will know that uh, that terms of reference get wider following a consultation period and um, they don't get narrower and, and, and actually that question in itself is asking you if anything has been missed not uh, whether you think there's anything in there that shouldn't be in there and in terms of whether you think there are other areas that's a free text uh, box uh, for you to be able to to complete and um, the second substantive question is what you think the inquiry um, should look at uh, first. And, and you'll recall that uh, at Elizabeth explained um, that there were uh, different areas uh, that the inquiry was going to look at. There was firstly the issues of um, central and devolved and local public health decisions. Then there were the, the health and care sectors, followed by the economic uh, response. And I think logically um, that is an order that is likely to, to be followed, but it does give you that opportunity to, to, to respond should you wish to do so. And the reason why I, th I think it's logical is that there has to be that layer of uh, governmental uh, decision making and direction and legislation which needs to be examined before we go on to consider the steps that were subsequently taken under those directions uh, from government. But of course it does give you that opportunity to respond and certainly in conversations that I've been having with people um, that there is a suggestion that that there is a benefit in the health and social care uh, sector providing a response that the logical uh, the logical uh, approach would be to take those issues first, not least because it will allow an additional period of recovery time for the NHS and care sector um, whilst uh, those earlier matters um, are dealt with by the inquiry. Um, moving on, the third substantive question is whether there should be a planned end date for the public hearings to ensure uh, timely findings and recommendations. And as Elizabeth has said, um, Baroness Hallett is, is very keen that this is not um, a protracted uh, public inquiry. That said, when you look at the terms of reference and you look at the key lines of inquiry, it's difficult to, to see how it's going to be a, a, a speedy um, approach to um, a final uh, report. Um, and if you if you think that uh, the average time for a public inquiry is just short of, of five years. Um, so I, I, when we say it's not going to be a protracted affair, let's take that against the backdrop of how long we know public inquiries do generally take particularly where there is a significant uh, amount of information to be looked at. And then the fourth um, substantive question is how the inquiry should be run. So um, how we're going to collate those views from people. Are we going to go out um, on the road, um, etc. Um, so, so in terms of, of moving on from that, and uh, again, I'm, I'm going to do a whistle top now, um, and um, I, I covered all of these in, in one of our earlier practical planning sessions for COVID inquiries. Um, but things that you need to be ticking off your list if you haven't already done so um, is whether you have your inquiry lead um, appointed within your organisation and the team set up around them. Um, and I can't stress enough that now that we have the terms of reference, these, the, these steps really must be taken. Um, the need for the stop notice. Um, I know that a lot of trusts have sent stop notice to a stop notice to all of their staff now to pre um, prevent the destruction of evidence. If you haven't done so, um, then can I uh, recommend that you you liaise with your colleagues at NHS England, um, who will be happy to share um, their stop notice uh, with you. Um, and of course, um, you know your local uh, your local uh, neighbouring trust may also have one. Um, are there processes? Um, have your processes been checked? Um, your processes for, for ensuring your contact details are correct for levers and key personnel? Um, a preparatory step to all of that is you are going to have to know who your, your, your key people are um, first, uh, your, key, you, your key decision makers during the course of the, the inquiry, um, whether that be um, at a strategic level or at a, a site level. Um, are they all still with you? If not, can you make sure they're up to date? Um, based on uh, on significant experience of inquiries, um, we can spend an awful lot of time um, when we are in the, the thrust of preparing for an inquiry in doing the administrative tasks. And if you can tick those off at the outset, um, it, it frees up time to do to do the important uh, evidential analysis in due course. And of course, you should have started. And if you haven't done so now, you've got the terms of reference, then please do so. Um, the process of collating and sequencing documentation and of course a reminder that that's anything that is relevant, i.e. 
would the inquiry like to see it? Um, and it might be things that in due course you are asked to provide disclosure of to the inquiry um, or that you may need to refer to when referencing statements or preparing reports um, in due course. And don't underestimate the need to keep your staff fully informed so that they, they are on board and they are engaged and feel supported uh, through the process. Um, in terms of some practicalities, just building on what I have just said, um, then in terms of your inquiry team, um, it's a question of ensuring that you have allocated sufficient time and resource, um, particularly in these times when there are competing challenges going on within each of your, your organisations. Um, and consider coordination um, and cooperation with partner organisations, um, whether be, that be in primary care or, or neighbouring uh, trust, if you're, you're an NHS uh, trust. Um, take some time to evaluate those terms of reference and the impact upon your organisation. Um, there may be things that are jumping out from those terms of reference that you think we had a particular problem. Um, and in the event that we're asked to provide relevant evidence, that might be an area where we provide uh, some evidence to the inquiry uh, in due course. And again, it's about when you have identified those problems within your own organisation, making sure you drill down and know specifically who the people are that you may in due course need to talk to if you need to produce evidence or you need to cross reference the accuracy of any data that you're going to provide uh, to the inquiry. Um, and assess what evidence your organisation will have against each of those uh, terms of reference. Um, have some uh, some strategic plans in place and some practical planning in place about how you're going to identify what's relevant documentation and then what are you going to do and how are you going to collate catalog and uh, and sequence it um, and I've talked at length at that in in, in previous uh, seminars as well and then how you're going to store it to ensure that it's safe um, from the the dreaded upgrade grades and data migration that we regularly see um, across the the NHS and then consider the role that you may have in due course. Um, how pivotal um, against those terms of reference do you think that your role um, is going to be as an organisation? Um, and do you think you have some meaningful uh, evidence um, and views that can be shared with the inquiry um, to help them with that fact finding process? And but also significantly for us as an NHS who, who are, are, are very keen uh, to, to learn from uh, every opportunity that, that that presents itself to us to ensure that we have that those learning um, opportunities. Um, and just in terms of the time frame, um, 7th of April, remember um, your date deadline for the consultation process um, on the terms of reference based on experience. And, and I stress that based on experience alone, um, you're not going to have a final um, set of terms of reference, I don't think, until May um, at the earliest and not least because we have um, Easter um, shortly after the closure of the consultation period. Um, we'll get a, a publication of the terms of reference. Um, there will then be certain core participants. They're, they're the key players um, who and, and people who with a key interest um, in the inquiry. Um, they'll be identified and there'll also be a process, though, um, which will enable other organisations and individuals to apply for core participant status to fully engage in the process of disclosure um, and, and the evidence of the, the inquiry. There'll be a timetable set and it'll be interesting to see what that timetable actually says in terms of the order which things are, are taken in, but also the deadlines and any long stops, um, excuse me, that we think um, that the inquiry team um, may um, put on, on the evidence. Um, and importantly, there will be a publication of guidance. There will be processes and procedures that will be um, published for the way in which evidence will be collated by the inquiry um, and how you are to submit that and who it who, who really uh, the inquiry team are looking to submit that data and in what form. Um, it's already been said um, by the, the inquiry team and Baroness Hallett that there'll be no public hearings before 2023 and it's likely to fall within three chapters in, in, in the three chapters identified um, earlier by Elizabeth in terms of those central devolved public health, then the health and social care sectors, and I would imagine the economic response. But within each of those chapters, of course, um, there are seven key lines of inquiry um, for the health and social care sector, which will be broken down into to subcategories. Um, and who knows um, when the report will be published, but let's hope that that it's right, that, that actually we are going to get a timely conclusion to the inquiry. Um, 
an, a timely report with uh, timely factual findings so that we can implement the recommendations um, that have been uh, made. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted now that I can I can hand over um, to um, I think Ryan um, Donahue is going to actually speak and he's supported today by Claire Edwards. Um, I'm, I'm working closely with Ryan um, and Claire um, and uh, I'm very grateful that they're going to share their insights um, into the, the early work that they've been doing as an organisation to prepare um, for the inquiry. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Ryan. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Liz. And uh, I'll kick us off and I, I think um, I'm sure Claire will come in on the uh, some of the details. So I think most of, of what we're going to cover was picked up, Liz, in, in your slides on preparing for the inquiry that you've just covered. Um, certainly the um, the one on, on immediate steps looks um, looks very familiar to us from the last couple of months. And I just wanted to say a few words about what we've been doing at, um, at MFT whilst we were we were waiting for the, the draft terms of reference to come out. That, that, that period that seemed to take an eternity of, you know, the anticipation of of seeing something on 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 paper. Um, uh, and what we've been doing has been about trying to do as much as, as we can to put ourselves in the best possible position to meet our ob obligations to respond to the inquiry, inquiry if and when um, the time comes um, for the organisation. Um, and that has meant taking some very practical and often basic um, steps and, and, and tasks, which, as I say, um, you've already picked up in the in the earlier slides. Uh, the first thing on a, on a team is to say that myself and Claire were appointed around around the the turn of the year to to coordinate the response to the inquiry from um, uh, for MFT and from across the organisation. So we're a dedicated resource um, for as long as it's needed. Um, I would say there are probably two main reasons why the trust wanted to um, to put this in place early on. The first is simply the size and scale of of um, MFT as a provider trust, and and along with that, its profile both in the uh, Greater Manchester conurbation and and uh, the Northwest um, region, and then related to that is that the trust played a key role in the collective response arrangements that were put in place across Greater Manchester during the pandem pandemic. And I'm talking here particularly about the fact that MFT hosts the Provider Federation Board, which um, I guess in the current terminology is the Provider Collaborative in the in the emerging GM Integrated Care System, the ICS. Um, so PFB has coordinated the, the collective provider response to the pandemic in, in GM, for example, in, in key areas such as mutual aid on critical care capacity, um, which you've, you've already um, alluded to, is, is um, one of the key lines of inquiry um, uh, indicated in the, the draft terms of reference. Um, and, and therefore, PFB has been a, a key or an important component, component of how, how GM has dealt with COVID over the last two years. Um, why that's important for us is that MFT as host holds the PFB files and documents on its systems and as such I think will be regarded as the, the data controller for the purposes of the of the inquiry. Um, so we potentially have an added obligation during the inquiry on disclosure of how decisions were taken at that broader GM level um, as well as by the by the trust itself. Um, so that type of uh, and scale of resource might not be necessary for all organisations, but I think the principle of, that you have described of identifying um, the resource needs and putting in place um, a team as soon as possible is, is probably applicable to most, if not if not all. Um, and from there, we've taken some very practical steps, such as the, the formality of, of issuing the, the stop notice or the document preservation notice, Liz, that um, you mentioned so we've circulated that through the usual comms channels, um, but also included a, a notice in a recent uh, payslip to give ourselves the assurance that that all staff had had received it and we'd have that assurance further down the line if we needed it. Um, we've built contact lists of key individuals across the organisations, both at the central group level, but also at um, at individual um, hospital sites within within MF, the MFT organisation. So that we know who to go to on specific issues if and when the need arises during the inquiry, and then we put in place governance arrangements to oversee the response and, and as importantly, draw in expertise from across MFT, um, and which can then report into the trust board um, if it's if it's needed as the inquiry um, progresses, depending on how it goes. Um, so our steering operational and oversight groups, they all bring together colleagues from areas such as um, I think you'd expect uh, infection prevention and control, procurement and finance operations, 
BPRR estates and, and comms. Um, and then I think finally for me, build, building on those on those very practical steps, our, our main task now is to, is to bring the documents um, uh, related, related to our, our response to, to, to COVID together into a dedicated storage space. Um, and, and now that we have the draft draft terms of reference organised and by the likely themes or, or key lines of an inquiry, we're expecting as, as they're set out in the terms of reference. Um, I know Claire's working very hard on this, so you might want to come in here, Claire, on, on how that's going uh, and what the um, what the significant issues and tasks uh, are arising from it. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely fine, Ryan. Um, so we have set up a SharePoint site um, that's allowed us to copy across all of our EPRR information um, to one centralised um, storage point that both myself, Ryan and Liz are able to access. We may widen that in due course, depending on the requirements that we've got. Um, and the task in front of us at the moment that we're currently working through is understanding all of the evidence that's there from an EPRR point of view and understanding how we can best use that from a key lines of inquiry perspective. Um, I think it's fair to say we were fortunate in the way that our EPRR team um, set up their initial storage of documentation. They've done an excellent job um, in collating it so far um, and they deserve credit for that because that I think will um, pay dividends further down the line for us. But at this point in time, it's about understanding all of the evidence that's there, um, doing some really basic admin um, roles within it, such as unembedding documents, um, which may seem, seem like nothing, but I've spent probably the past week unembedding a number of papers from agendas that we need to be able to have as individual documents. So that's just um, a key word of warning, really, that there'll probably be um, a myriad of um, information that you need to try and get hold of and then unembed and store as separate documents. Um, and then what we are going to do after we finish that and we've got all of our documents in front of us, is start to think about those key lines of inquiry and how we can start to replicate those documents in different folders. I guess one of the key points that Elizabeth said at the very beginning that I'm starting to see as I go through them is that overlap between between the key lines of inquiry and actually there will be a number of documents that you can use in a variety of different ways and it's about understanding how we can best utilise the information we've got and then um, align that to the categorisation and the schedule that, that Liz was then talking about and how we make that um, easy to use and easy, uh, easily accessible when it comes to submitting anything nationally. So at the moment, it's about understanding. I think we've got about 13,000 30, yeah, 13, um, documents that we've got in that SharePoint site, and we're just trying to understand what's within all of them. Um, next stage for us, we'll be doing the separate folders, starting to think about how we can utilise it and schedule it and then we'll take it from there depending on what the ask is from a national perspective. I think in our head we're working towards the end of May to have everything ready to go as much as possible. Um, what that isn't taking into account at the point this point in time is site level information. So all of our EPRR documentation is at what we call within our organisation group level. So that was the decisions that our strategic um, group took at trust level. What we will then need to think about is what is held at site level and how do we access that. Um, I've already made contact with operational leads within each of the sites and we have identified people who will be able to support us with that. But we'll need to think about how we replicate this rather large piece of work down at site um, level, maybe even down to ward level, depending on what's requested, particularly from a critical care perspective. But that is a little bit of the unknown at the moment. So the, the easiest option is to try and focus on what we've got in front of us, get that into some semblance of order and then understand where our gaps are and any areas that we feel we need to have a key particular focus for ourselves. Um, I think that probably summarises where we are. Um, and I don't think that there's anything else to add from my perspective at that point. Thanks, Claire. Um, I think the only thing I would add, uh, just to finish off, is that is that clearly there's still a lot of unknowns with the inquiry in terms of of timeframes and the implications or the extent of inv of involvement for individual organisations like like MFT. But but at the minute we're just trying to do as much as possible to prepare and work on the basis that we you know there will be an obligation for us and I guess tick as many as those of those boxes, Liz, that you described earlier as as we can at this stage. Thanks, Ryan and Claire. I um, really appreciate that, and I'm I'm sure everybody attending um have really appreciated hearing how it's actually being done 
um, in practice uh, rather than just listening to the, the the more strategic analysis. Really grateful. Um, many thanks again for all of you for for attending. Um, check out some of our earlier webinars um, if you um, missed them. Um, get in touch um, if there are ways that we can um, support you moving forward. Um, and thanks again to, to Claire, Ryan and um, Elizabeth as well um, for their um, involvement in this session. And no doubt we will be seeing you again for another web webinar um, in the not too distant future. Thanks. <laughs>